There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. And here I am with a, I know I said I wouldn't, but I did anyway, book haul video. Part one. So let me explain. I feel like I'm having to explain myself to my parents, but I think you're not my parents. You're my enablers. So I'm among friends, right? But I swore off buying any books at all until May because of my current retrenchment. And I did anyway yesterday. But they were used books, and I think I got 11 books for a, just under 30 bucks, so not so about $3 a book, right? So here's what happened. The, one of the reasons I'm so broke is that I'm in preparation for renewing my work visa in May. I am paying three years of tax because my whole life I have never paid my income tax on time. Why? It doesn't make sense. Why? 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 So when it's time to renew my work visa, I have to prove that I've paid my tax. So in the three or four months before, I pay three years worth of tax. So yesterday I filed my 2015 income tax return. <sighs> and it was slightly less than I expected. Some, quite a bit less actually. I hope the next two years will be too, but I don't know. Anyway, so that was my justification. And I've examined these books, I've perused them quite carefully since then because I was on such a high having finally broken through my resistance to getting this tax crap done and I still have two more years to do. I was so glad to have pierced through the resistance that I just fell into these books while looking through them and most of them start out really great. So I'm not going to read you the opening sentence, I'm going to read you the opening paragraph, sometimes two paragraphs in one or two cases more than a page from each. So this is going to be a chatty book haul. And if you're not interested in longer excerpts, this won't be the video for you. There's a couple that I'm not even going to bother reading from because they don't stand alone as a opening sentence or paragraph. But most of them, you're going to get a longer excerpt. So that's why I've divided it into two parts, even though I only have 11 books. Ah. So yeah, I'm really excited about most of these. Here is the first one. And I've paired the first two because their openings resonate quite lusciously, I think. This is a Korean novel. Actually, it's a collection of short stories called A Man by Hwang Soon Won. And this is, I'd never heard of this series, but it's called Portable Library of Korean Literature. There's a whole series of these out of Seoul. This is number 23 in the series. Oh, and it's translated by Bruce and Ju Chan Fulton. The English translation is copyright 2003, so quite recent. But the original stories in Korean were published between 1947 and 1956. I had never heard of Hwang Soon Won, but he's described on the back as Korea's most successful short story writer. Perhaps its most consistently interesting fictional voice. The translation seems pretty good. So here's the opening to the story, The Dog of Crossover Village. The pages aren't big. I'm going to read you the first three short paragraphs. Strike out in any direction, and you had a narrow pass to cross. Except for a long, winding valley to the south, mountains were all around, and whatever your destination, a narrow pass awaited you. And so the settlement had come to be called Crossover Village. There was a time, from early one spring to late in the fall, when quite a few people bound for the Pyongan region passed through Crossover Village. Those arriving by the pass from the south inevitably stopped to rest their tired legs at the well, in front of the shacks beneath the mountains to the west. These were not what you would call small families. There was the occasional young couple, man and wife probably, but it was mostly large families who filed through the narrow pass from the south. The younger people toted cloth bundles from which tattered clothing poked forth, while the old folks limped along trying to keep the youngsters in hand. The women carried babies on their backs, loads on their heads. Okay, I love that opening. It certainly plunks you right down in the, in the middle of this crossover village. I can picture it. So that's very interesting. This is uh, less than 100 pages, 80, 81 pages. I haven't read much Korean literature, so looking forward to checking this out. Probably sooner rather than later. And the next one I'm pairing with it because this is an Egyptian novel, City of Love and Ashes by Yusuf Idris. Originally published in Arabic quite a while ago, 1956, 
This translation is 1999, translated by R. Neil Hewison. So this is set in 1952, so Egypt was in flux, trying to break free of British colonialism, and it centers on two young radicals from that period. And I just found there's an interesting resonance between this crossover village, people passing through, and this opening paragraph. The tram terminal in Shubra al-Balad is more than just the beginning of a tram line. It is a pivot of constant interplay between Cairo and its suburbs, between the city and the many factories scattered around it. You see village folk here coming to the capital, awestruck by the city, breathless at the drone of the great bustle and the new world. You see sullen workers in the bustle too, resentful of the city, but unable to escape it. So just this interplay crossing point, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, the writing, I like that, the writing of that paragraph pretty, pretty much. And the person who had it before me finished chapter one according to their bookmark, and it's a beautiful bookmark from an Egyptian bookstore. Look at that. It has uh, information in both Arabic and English on the back. But I hope I make it further than the previous reader did. It's a beautiful soft cover with flaps and uh, obviously unread. Irene Nemirovsky is a writer I've heard a lot about, especially her most famous one, Sweet Francaise. This is another of her novels called David Golder. Published in 1930, set in the frenzied capitalism of the 1920s. I assume France, but uh, yeah, France. And it's about a rich Jewish man who has sold his soul. For two dollars, I couldn't pass it up. And finally, I have been looking everywhere for an affordable copy of this book since so many people have been talking about Anita Bruckner, and I could never find the one that everybody said was her best, the Booker Prize winning Hotel du Lac. And I finally found it. It's in beautiful, gently used condition for three bucks yesterday. Now here's the deal with Anita Bruckner. I started one of her novels and, it, and bailed on it back in the day when I wasn't a big bailer, like 10, 12, 13 years ago. Didn't like it. Can't remember even what it was called. For all I know, it may have been this one. And then I have heard people talk about her. Her two main devotees that I know personally or through podcasts are Jenny at Reading Envy, but especially Thomas from The Readers, who just loves her stuff. I think he's rereading all of her novels right now. But when they read from Anita Bruckner, it leaves me cold. So my prediction is this is not going to be for me, but why not? So I'm going to read you the opening, and that kind of confirms my suspicion. But what do you think? It just leaves me cold. It's not bad writing. It just doesn't give, provoke any visceral anything in me. So here is the opening paragraph, which is fairly long. From the window, all that could be seen was a receding area of grey. It was to be supposed that beyond the grey garden, which seemed to sprout nothing but the stiffish leaves of some unfamiliar plant, lay the vast grey lake, spreading like an aesthetic toward the invisible further shore. And beyond that, in imagination only, yet verified by the brochure, the peak of the Dong Dosh, on which snow might already be slightly and silently falling. For it was late September, out of season, the tourists had gone, the rates were reduced, and there were few inducements for visitors in this small town at the water's edge, whose inhabitants, uncommunicative to begin with, were frequently rendered taciturn by the dense cloud that descended for days at a time, and then vanished without warning to reveal a new landscape, full of color and incident, boats skimming on the lake, passengers at the landing stage, an open-air market, the outline of the gaunt remains of a 13th century castle, seams of white on the far mountains and on the cheerful uplands to the south, a rising backdrop of apple trees, the fruit sparkling with emblematic significance. For this was a land of prudently harvested plenty, a land which had conquered human accidents, leaving only the weather distressingly beyond control. Okay, so once again, when I hear myself reading it out loud, I, uh, I like it more than when I read it to myself silently. But it, it still doesn't, other than that, it's, it's pretty, it's well written. I'll, of course I will give her that. This, this one, the Booker, it was published in 84, so maybe won the Booker in 84 or 85. I don't know, though. Yeah, I can appreciate the beauty, but it's very antiseptic somehow for me. But I'm going to try it, so I finally got, got a copy, so I will try it. Tell me, how do you and Anita Bruckner get along? 
Okay, this next one, this is an exact duplicate of the copy I used to have, or maybe still do have in a box somewhere in Canada. But this is one of Muriel Sparks' novellas, The Driver's Seat. And my relationship to this book is quite confusing for me. I studied her as an undergrad, and I thought that this was on the curriculum. But now I can't remember, because I read the first few pages, and I'm going to read the first few pages to you, because they're just wonderful. But I have no memory whatsoever of it, and maybe I've gotten it confused in my mind, because I remember after I finished that modern British novel class, which was the best undergrad class that I took, I loved it so much that I considered switching my major from history to literature at that time, but didn't, but then went back and did the equivalent of a honors degree, undergrad degree in English literature a few years later, and then went on to do my master's. But this class was just a really special experience for me. We studied the comforters, and maybe that's all. I thought we studied the comforters and the driver's seat, but now I, I can't remember this book, so maybe we didn't. But what I remember is after I finished that class, I went to the local used bookstore, which is still there in Saskatoon. It's called 8th Street Books. And they had a fantastic selection of modern British fiction. And I bought everything they had by any of the authors I'd studied that I liked. So I had at one time probably almost a complete set of Muriel Spark. And maybe that's why I got this book. And I don't think in that case that I ever read it. I will rectify that soon. But it was the same movie tie-in. I don't like movie tie-in editions. But Liz Taylor may be ex an exception. And I've never seen the movie. This is about an office worker who goes south on holiday. That's all it really says in the back. This fascinating episode in the first chapter, it's so fascinating that I'm going to read it to you. This page, this page, and then this paragraph, okay? Because it's just wow. <laughs> and the material doesn't stain, the sales girl says. Doesn't stain? It's the new fabric, the sales girl says. Specially treated. Won't mark. If you spill like a bit of ice cream or a drop of coffee, like down the front of this dress, it won't hold the stain. The customer, a young woman, is suddenly tearing at the fastener at the neck, pulling at the zip of the dress. She is saying, get this thing off me, off me at once. The sales girl shouts at the customer, who up to now has been delighted with the bright colored dress. It is patterned with green and purple squares on a white background with blue spots within the green squares, cyclamen spots within the purple. This dress has not been a successful line. Other dresses in the new stainless fabric have sold, but this, of which three others, identical but for sizes, hang in the back storeroom awaiting the drastic reductions of next week's sale, has been too vivid for most customers' taste. But the customer who now steps speedily out of it, throwing it on the floor with the utmost irritation, had almost smiled with satisfaction when she had tried it on. She had said, that's my dress. The sales girl had said it needed taking up at the hem. All right, the customer had said, but I need it for tomorrow. We can't do it before Friday, I'm sorry, the sales girl had said. Oh, I'll do it myself then, the customer had said, and turned round to admire it sideways in the long mirror. It's a good fit. Lovely colors, she said. And it doesn't stain, the sales girl had said, with her eye wandering to another unstainable and equally unsaleable summer dress, which evidently she hoped now to offer the satisfied customer. Doesn't stain? The customer has flung the dress aside. The sales girl shouts as if to assist her explanation. Specially treated fabric. If you spill like a drop of sherry, you just wipe it off. Look. Miss, you're tearing the neck. Do you think I spill things on my clothes? The customer shrieks. Do I look as if I don't eat properly? Miss, I only remarked on the fabric that when you tell me you're going abroad for your vacation, there is always the marks that you pick up on your journey. Don't treat our clothes like that, if you please, miss. I only said stain resisting, and then you carry on after you liked it. Who asked you for a stain-resisting dress? The customer shouts, getting quickly with absolute purpose into her own blouse and skirt. You like the colors, didn't you? Shouts the girl. What difference does it make? So it resists stains if you like the fabric before you knew. The customer picks up her bag and goes to the door, almost at a run, 
while two other salesgirls and two other customers gasp and gape. At the door, she turns to look back and says, with a look of satisfaction at her own dominance over the situation, with an undoubtable excuse, I won't be insulted! Just look at that opening scene. So, no, I have no memory of it. I'm going to read it or maybe reread it. Probably soon, because it's 107 pages. So, The Driver's Seat by Muriel Spark. And also, this year, I very much want to read her The Mandelbaum Gate, which I never, ever read. This is the centenary of her birth. Not, I put out a tweet that uh, some certain people like Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventure have been teasing me about. As an old geezer, I don't quite relate to this newfangled habit of wishing dead authors happy birthday on their, on this on the anniversary of their birth when they're dead. But so I won't say happy birthday, Muriel. I think she might agree with me. She was a, a little prickly herself. The last book that I'll do on part one of this video. Uh, I couldn't believe that I found it because it's rare at this used bookstore. It's called Book Off, and it's 99% uh, Japanese books, manga, DVDs, and whatnot. But they do have a pretty good English section, the one at Shibuya. But it's very unusual to find something so recent. This is a 2017 novel, Young Jane Young by Gabriel Zevin. And she's famous for The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery, which I've never read. But I love the title. And I love the cover, and it's a lovely oversized uh, soft cover. And I think this is the only one that I paid four dollars for. Everything else was three or two dollars. And actually, now I don't know if I'm going to like the book. So it, it's kind of like a Monica Lewinsky novel. This young woman has an affair with a congressman. It comes out into public. The congressman doesn't suffer any negative consequences, but she does, and she is slut shamed. So interesting, but I think it's. Probably it's just going to be a story, not a literary novel, but I'm going to try it. But how about that cover? And Young Jane Young, I think it really has a nice ring to it. So that is part one of my, what did I say? I'll have to, I can't remember that phrase, but that's going to be the title of the video, whatever I said at the beginning. So stay tuned for part two, which probably I won't get up until a day later, but thanks for watching.